for the next few moments, quiet your mind and listen carefully with your whole heart. Take a deep breath in. Hold it. Now breathe out. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Deep breath in. Hold it. Now breathe it out. Jesus didn't say you might find rest, or that somehow you'll find rest as you wander aimlessly through this life. He said, come to me, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. It's a promise. He goes on to tell us that he is gentle, and that in him our very souls will find rest. Breathe in. Hold. Breathe out. You can take Jesus at his word. You can choose to take all your cares and worries, anxiety and pain, habits and hurts, and give them to Jesus. Are you restless? Are you weary and worn out? If given the opportunity, could today be that day of rest? As you breathe in and breathe out, Remember that Jesus is patiently waiting for you to come to him, bringing everything that's weighing you down. Jesus is waiting to give you rest. Good morning. This is not what I had intended. I went to bed last night. Temperature was about 34 degrees. It was raining. I get up at 530 this morning, anticipating driving to the church to see how the parking lot is, fully anticipating that we are going to be able to have service this morning, and um, I can't get off my hill. And while this isn't like meeting together, I am still thankful that we're able to have this time together. I was laughing the other day with somebody about um, the fact that I feel sorry for kids nowadays because they'll never know what it's like to have a true snow day since they have all this virtual learning and everything. And it, it dawned on me that we, as pa me as a pastor, I'll never know what it's like to have a snow Sunday again either because, um, again, we've got this great tool before us to where we can meet together and I'm thankful we're able to do that. Real quick, let's go ahead and get into the message this morning because I'm going to be honest with you. I got a very short time to do this, and there's a good chance you're going to hear my boys wake up in a little bit screaming, Mama. So if you hear that, um, I'm going to do my best to ignore it. You do your best to ignore it as well. But a couple of weeks ago when we started off this series on rest, I made a statement. I said, what affects your body will eventually affect your mind. And what affects your mind will eventually affect your soul. Believe it or not, our souls even need rest. But how do we know when our souls need rest? A Christian psychologist um, who does a blog that I follow quite often was talking about the subject of soul rest or soul sleep not too long ago. And he gave these five indicators to tell us when our soul needs rest. Number one, do you feel numb? You know what I mean by feeling numb? You've had so many things happen to you in your life, you're just not surprised anymore. And not only are you not surprised, you just really don't even have any feeling when something bad comes your way. So if you have this feeling of numbness, there's a good chance that you need rest. The next two I'm going to combine together. Do you feel out of place in a crowd? Or when you're in a crowd, do you try purposely to become distance? Again, we all know what it means to be in these situations. We've all been around people when it was just a day that we didn't want to be around people. And you know what? No matter what we did, we did not feel like we belonged in that crowd. 
So what did we do? We distanced ourselves, and we did it on purpose. Well, that's a good indicator that our soul needs rest. Last week, I hit on this one a little bit. Have your passions died? You know, for some, they, they really enjoy hunting. They really enjoy fishing. I really enjoy fishing. Um, for some ladies, they really enjoy crafting or they really enjoy reading. When you come to a point in your life where the things that you used to love start to fade away, that is a good indicator that your soul needs rest. The last one's one that really stuck out to me. It said, you don't feel like helping anyone. Hmm. How many of us have been there before? We know somebody who's in need of help. We know somebody who's in a very bad situation. And let's just be honest. We don't feel like helping them. For whatever reason, it's not because we hate the individuals, because this could be your family, this could be your neighbor, this could be your friend. But for whatever reason, we just don't feel like helping them. That is a good indicator that our soul needs rest. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Not only did Jesus know that our soul needed rest, David, the man after God's own heart, knew this very well also. And in one of his Psalms, he gives us a secret a secret to rest for our souls. Now, this is a psalm that most of us have heard, most of us are familiar with. Uh, matter of fact, this could even be considered the most famous of all psalms. It's the 23rd Psalm. And if you have your Bible with you real quick, I really hope you do. Do me a favor. Go ahead and turn to the 23rd Psalm. You know, rarely do we go to a funeral when we don't hear this psalm read. I mean, over the last couple of months. Um, I have been able to attend some funerals. They've been small. But at the same time, this psalm was read. Now, being a pastor, I know the purpose of the preacher reading this psalm during this time, because this psalm is to bring us comfort during times of trouble, during times of pain. And a lot of people, I think, get a misinterpretation of this. Because I think they believe that this psalm is a psalm for the dead. When all actually, this psalm is a psalm for the, le- for the living. Now again, I'm not blaming the pastors for reading this at a funeral. I think it's a great scripture to read at a funeral. I've read it at a funeral. But this scripture is not intended for our loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord. The scripture was meant for us who are going through some hard times. And well, let's just get into it so I can show you what I'm talking about. 23rd Psalm goes like this, and I'm going to read it just to make sure that I don't mess it up. It's early in the morning. I have not had my cup of coffee yet, so y'all bear with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Pray with me. Father, this morning I just pray that you will allow this scripture not only to speak to our bodies, not only to speak to our minds, but also to speak to our souls. Father, we all need rest. Maybe this morning you allowed this snow to happen just so that we could truly have a time of rest. So this morning, Lord, as we dig into this scripture over the next few minutes, speak to our souls. Help us to realize 
the rest that we have in you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before we get into what this psalm is really talking about, I want us to hit on um, five main points that David talks about right at the beginning of this psalm. And you got to understand that David is using this psalm as an illustration of his previous occupation. David knew what it was like to be a shepherd. So David is using his past experiences to help the reader understand God and to understand him in some pretty hard situations. The first thing that David points out is he provides his needs. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. A shepherd's job is to provide for the needs of the sheep. And just like David had to provide for the needs of the sheep, he knew that the Lord provided our needs as well. He goes on to say that he makes me lie down in green pastures. I love the way he puts that. And he leads me beside still waters. One thing about sheep that a lot of people don't understand is sheep are very skittish animals. And um, the reason he lies them beside still waters and he makes them to lay down in green pastures is because whenever sheep are in a situation where it's a little bit uncertain, God nourishes these sheep by putting them or the shepherd nourishes these sheep by putting them in a situation to where they can be nourished, a green pasture where they can feed still waters where they won't be scared by the rippling and waves of a river. He puts them in a state of ease to where they can eat. Now, that doesn't mean he always puts them in a good situation, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but he puts them at a state of ease to where they can have nourishment. Ultimately, God is our nourishment, isn't he? The next one, he restores me. This one is huge. This one's major for me. I, I, I love this part of the psalm. Because when I think of my life, when I think of my past, I think of what I've been restored from. And, you know, sheep can get in some pretty bad situations themselves. They can can get hurt. They can get wounded. And um, there's times that the shepherd has to care for that sheep. There's times that the shepherd has to um, actually help that sheep get back to health. You know, some said that the one of the reasons that a shepherd carried the crook or the staff was so that um, if the sheep was being disobedient, that he would break its leg and then he would carry the sheep for a long way. And guys, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if that's true or not. We've all heard that before. Um, Can't say that there ain't a couple of individuals that I hadn't wanted to break their legs before. Um, Um, but at the same time, he's comparing the shepherd to someone who, who restores, he restores our souls is what it says. Find comfort in that this morning. It says he guides me. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name sake. And you got to understand again, coming from the shepherd, um, the sheep, were more than just animals for these shepherds. They were their livelihood. So they wanted these sheep to be perfect. They wanted to make sure that there were no burrs in the wool because that would just make it harder um, after they sheared them to to make the cotton. And guys, again, I don't know how they did it or make the wool, not cotton, but I don't know how they did it back then. But at the same time, they wanted these sheep to be perfect. God desires for us to be perfect. Now, while we can't do this on ourselves, he does a lot of things that helps us in this manner. So he guides them in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. The last thing that get that really speaks to me out of this is he protects me. The son, David said, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. One of the reasons that our soul doesn't have any rest is because we just don't feel like we have any security. Security is huge. Security is huge not only for me, but for many individuals. I know many of you probably sleep by a gun by your bed. Um, 
I sleep with one pretty close, not by my bed, but it's pretty close and I can get to it pretty easy. And I do that as a sense of protection, as a sense of security. And we all like this security in one way, shape, or another. Women, they have, they have different things that make them secure. Um, a, a husband that loves them regardless, that brings great security to a, to a woman. But at the same time, guys, these are, these are things that we need. We need to be nourished. We need to have our needs met. We need restoration. We need to be guided. We need to feel secure for our soul to really get rest. And that's what David's trying to get at here. You have this God who does all of this for you. He takes care of you. He nourishes you. Man, he restores you. These things should bring you comfort and not comfort in good situations, but actually just the opposite. Comfort in some very, very bad situations. Because what David's getting to here is he's talking about these things that he leans on to God for in some very, very difficult situations. Two situations he points out here. The valley of the shadow of death. When this is read at a funeral, I think a lot of people, the bereaved people, think of this as the journey that their loved ones are going through. The journey of going from life to death to eternity. But we need to understand something. That death is not a journey. Death is a finality. It is the end of our existence on this earth. So death's really not a journey because we've even been told by Paul to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's not a journey. That's instant. So death is not a journey. So what's he talking about here? Again, going back to his former occupation. David knew what it was like to shepherd in the land of Israel. And Israel is a land of valleys and very, very, very steep mountains. The mountains are always seen as a safe place. It's a safer place to be on a mountain. I feel safer being up here on these mountains. Um, we were talking about a couple of days ago, me and another lady. We're talking about how, how awesome it is that it seems like every time a major storm is coming, you can watch it as it gets closer on the radar and it just starts to dissipate as it gets to about Blue Ridge or so. And I think a lot of that's because of these mountains that we live in. They shelter us. Mountains are safe places, but valleys are just the opposite. Valleys are where wolves roam. Valleys are where dangerous snakes are. Danger, valleys are where all the things that can really harm us, that's where they reside. That's where the water is. That's where the food is. And that's where everything that stands against us is as well. In our life, we've heard this, that we're either on top of the mountain or we're in the valley. All of us have those mountaintop experiences to where everything is going good. But we always have those valley experiences as well. And somebody told me one time that you're either heading down into the valley, which is a place that we really don't want to be. It's a lonely place. It's a hard place. Or we're making our way up the mountain. There's no in-between. There's no plateau. There's no just things being well. It's either things are going really good or things are starting to go really bad. And that's what the psalmist, that's what David's talking about here. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I walk through some of the darkest times in my life, even though I walk through times to where there are dangers, 
I don't fear anything. Why? Because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When I was in Boy Scouts, I can remember they took us over to, um, to Young Harris College for the haunted house. And I don't think anything about me. I know. Shouldn't be going to haunted houses. It's okay, I promise. But we went over to the haunted house at Young Harris College, and um, we were in line, and they were pairing us off in groups to um, to get ready to go through this. And I'm going to be honest with you, I was scared to death. Um, I was really little, didn't have my mama with me, and that was a bad situation for Scotty. Well, evidently, this six foot six individual, or at least he seemed six foot six. I mean, I was little. Everything seemed bigger. Um, probably 200, probably 240 pounds. I was thinking 300 pounds, but this big individual, he could tell that I was scared. He could tell that I did not want to go in this. And he just patted me on the shoulder. He said, stay behind me. You'll be okay. And you know, I listened to him. And I'm going to be honest with you. I went through that haunted house and yeah, there's a lot of scary stuff in there, but I wasn't bothered. Why wasn't I bothered? Dude, I had this WWF wrestler in front of me leading the way. I wasn't scared of nothing. We come to the last portion and there's this guy behind these bars. It's like this little cage and he's talking to us. And all of a sudden the guy gets really quiet. And I knew something's about to happen. So I get a little bit closer to this big gentleman. And about that time, a chainsaw cranks up. The guy breaks through the bars and comes after us. Well, I look for the big gentleman that I've been following all this time, and he's gone. I mean, he was out of there. Through the whole thing, he was rock solid, but up to the last point when I really needed it, he was gone. So what did I do? I didn't take off running. I got down on my knees and started crying. God's not like that. God doesn't leave us when we need him the most. Matter of fact, that's when he's even more present. Sure, we may not always feel him there, But God is protecting us in the middle of some of our hardest situations. He is our shepherd. And when he is with us, there's nothing that we need. He gives us comfort. He gives us nourishment. He restores our souls. He guides us. And most importantly, he protects us. The next thing David says is something that's kind of puzzling to me. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, guys, just like the valley of the shadow of death, a table in front of your enemies is not a place that we want to be. It's really not. But God says that he makes these appointments. He makes these times. But even during these times, he wants us to know that he is with us. Who's setting the table? God is. Who's there with us? Jesus is. Who's going to protect us in this situation? He will. And some would say, well, Scotty, wouldn't it be more comforting? Wouldn't it be easier if God would just take us out of these situations? not going to lie. It would be easier. It would be a lot easier if God would take us out of these situations. But it wouldn't more, offer more security to us. It wouldn't be good for God to take us out of these bad situations. Because if we wasn't in these bad situations... Can you really tell me that you would need God? God uses bad situations. 
He uses bad situations to show us how much he loves us. He uses bad situations to show us that he's protecting us. And he uses bad situations to grow our faith and our trust in him. He is our shepherd. And even when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, or when we're in the presence of all of our enemies, we have nothing to fear. He's with us. The book of Daniel is evidence that God doesn't always take us out of bad situations. And I want to test your Bible knowledge this morning just real quick. Most of us know the, the situation that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in. They would not do as Nebuchadnezzar commanded. And for a punishment, he fired up a furnace. Hotter than any other furnace. So hot that even when the person went to go open it, when the servant went to go open the furnace, he died instantly from the heat. Because of their disobedience... Nebuchadnezzar throws Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into that furnace. After a minute had passed, one of the servants looks into the furnace. And he tells Shadrach, or he tells Nebuchadnezzar, didn't we just throw three people? There goes the snowplow. Sorry about that. Didn't we just throw three people in the, in the furnace? Nebuchadnezzar said, yeah. The servant says, why is there four? I see a fourth one. Let me ask you a question. Who got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the furnace? Now, before you answer, think about it real clear. When Nebuchadnezzar looked in, he cried out to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, Come out. And they come out. God didn't get them out of that situation. But he was with them through the heat of that fire. You go on a couple of chapters later and you see Daniel. Again, Daniel's in a situation to where he wasn't following all the king's orders. Daniel's thrown into a lion's den, and Nebuchadnezzar was kind of conflicted about this because he is actually starting to like Daniel. So he gets thrown into a lion's den. And Daniel's there all night long. Nebuchadnezzar wakes up the next morning and runs, runs to find out what's happened. When he goes down, he cries out, Daniel, Daniel. Daniel replies, I'm here. Nebuchadnezzar's amazed. He's thrown into a den full of lions, and he's still alive. Daniel replies, the Lord has saved me through this situation. So who got Daniel out of the lion's den? Think about it real close. Because Nebuchadnezzar is the one who commanded for him to be taken out of the lion's den. But God's the one who protected him in the middle of that great danger. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what's going on in your life. And like I said before, we're either climbing towards the mountain or we're falling into the valley. There's going to be a time that you're going to need this. Because whenever we're in the valley, we feel like we're all alone. We feel like we're distant. We feel out of place. It's good to know that this psalm is telling us that regardless of whatever's going on in our life, that God is with us. That should bring rest to our soul. 
Chuck put it on the sign one time, and it's one that stuck with me. Peace is not the absence of adversity. Peace is the presence of God in adversity. How true is that? Our peace, our comfort comes from knowing that God has promised us. I'm here. I'm with you. And I'm never going to leave you. Pray with me. Father, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for never leaving me. I want to thank you for always loving me. And I want to thank you for this word that you've given us this morning. Use it, Lord, to bring rest to our souls. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Again, guys, sorry about this morning. But I am so thankful for this word. God bless.